All right. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the October 6, 2021 meeting of the Daytona Beach City Commission. We're happy to have you with us tonight. Uh, Ms. LaMagna will, re will review the procedures for tonight's meeting. Good evening. Agendas are available on the table in the lobby and at the front of the commission chambers. All the exhibits pertaining to items on the agenda are posted in the lobby. Please feel free to view the exhibits at any time during tonight's meeting. You are required to fill out a yellow form to speak before the city commission on topics on the agenda. Forms are available on the table in the lobby and at the front of the commission chambers. You must complete the sections that ask for your name, address, agenda item number, signature, and date. The form must be completed and placed in the designated box. Item number seven is your opportunity to address the City Commission concerning any item on the consent agenda. Please indicate on the yellow speaker sheet the agenda item number of the item or items that you are addressing. Items or discussions not listed on the consent agenda will not be heard during this comment section. Agenda items <clears throat> under item number nine are public hearing, hearings and citizens may speak at the designated time. Speakers will be allowed to speak for three minutes. When you approach the lectern, please speak clearly into the microphone and give your full name and address. The three-minute clock on the monitor above the dais will start running when you begin to speak. Pay close attention to your time. You will be told when your time has expired. Item number 12 is the public comment forum, and this is the opportunity for the public to speak on any issue or topic that is not on the agenda. All citizens completing the green form will be allowed to speak for three minutes. When you approach the lectern, please give your full name and address. Disorderly conduct in the public meeting of the City Commission. Article 2, Section 6238 of the City Code of Ordinances reads as follows. It shall be unlawful for any person to behave in a riotous or disorderly manner in any public meeting of the City Commission, or any committee, agency, or board thereof, or to cause any unnecessary disturbances therein by force, shouting, or any other action that is calculated to disrupt such meeting, or to refuse to obey any ruling of the presiding officer, or such meeting relative to the orderly process thereof. Please be courteous and respectful of the views of others. Personal attacks on the city commission, city staff, or members of the public are not allowed. Please silence cell phones and other wireless devices during the meeting. All conversation must take place either at the lectern or on the dais so that everyone can hear the business being discussed tonight. Ms. LaMagna, may I have a roll call? Commissioner Henry? Here. Commissioner Reed? Here. Commissioner Traeger? Here. Commissioner May? Here. Commissioner Cantu? Here. Mayor Derek L. Henry? Here. We will now have the invocation led by Commissioner Reed, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Henry. Let us pray. <clears throat> Most gracious and honorable God, it's once again that we come before your throne. It's once again you've allowed us to open our eyes and see yet another day. We thank you for a city called Daytona Beach, Lord God. We thank you for the citizens that reside here and the harmony that we have one with another. We thank you for the visitors that, that keep the tax roll rolling and keep our city functioning. Lord, we thank you that as we prepare for homecoming for the great Bethune-Cookman University, that you brought Mary home today. We thank you for those who sit on that board, our mayor and, and um, our honorable mayor and, and the Lohman family and so many others who sit there and who have made this possible for our state to recognize one of our own, Mother Mary. Now, Lord, as we gather tonight, help us to be on one accord. Help us, even if we agree to disagree. Help us to, um, to be unified in thought, to be considerate and conscientious of the, the concerns of our citizenry. And help us, Lord, that when we lay our heads on our pillow this evening, we can say that we did what we thought was the best in regards of all. I give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And in the matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Let us all say, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll now move on to item number four, which is approval of the minutes of the September 8th, 2021 regular city commission meeting. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, let it be uh, noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. <clears throat> motion carries 6-0. Now move on to agenda item number five. Uh, if there are any changes, our city manager will address. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir, no deletions, one addition. 
and add an item to 8K allocation of bike week sponsorship funds to consent items. That would be pursuant to Commissioner May's request. Mm -hmm. yeah, please. Okay. Motion to approve the agenda with the said change. Okay. I have a motion from Commissioner Reed, second from Commissioner Traeger. Do you have any questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6 0. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to item number six, we have no presentations tonight, so we'll move on to item number seven. This is the public comments. During this time, citizens have the opportunity to address the city commission on any item on the consent agenda. And our first speaker is John Nicholson, and on deck is Frederick Brown. And John Nicholson speaking on 8B. John Nicholson, 413 North Grandview Avenue, uh, B, D, and H. Uh, B is, we've been waiting for that for a long time. It's affordable housing. Um, hopefully, this is a very comprehensive study rather than just a very minor um, obligatory uh, study. Uh, we went through this years ago uh, with LPGA, and at one point it was asked that, oh, we don't include the housing in Daytona Beach when we were looking for affordable housing to build LPJ. Well, we don't want to do that again. We want to include not only the housing in the city of Daytona Beach, but those around us. So we, want to, we absolutely need to know where the affordable housing is, not just in the city. Holly Hill, South Daytona, they also have affordable housing. So I'm asking you to make sure that this is comprehensive and not just obligatory to do what somebody else wants to be done. Uh, secondly, um, we're going to give $33,000 for the tennis center. We wouldn't give $33,000 to maintain the tennis center when it was here, but we're going to give them $33,000 to have a tournament. Um, that seems a bit unusual. Uh, lastly, um, the Windsor Mailey. Uh, originally, there was a discussion about giving away the Windsor and the Mailey after 15 years. The developers would come in, they would redevelop it, and after 15 years, they would have control of the building. This appears to say that it's a 99-year lease. They're going to combine the two, rename it, and turn it into Section 8 only. So is there some clarification on that? Are we losing it? And is it going to be only Section 8 housing? Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Frederick Brown, and on deck is Sharice Boyd. Being Frederick Brown, 1508 Crescent Ridge, Daytona Beach. Um, in regards to AG, and I realize that you've already awarded the contract, but uh, especially Mr. Mayor, I know we've talked about this in the past. This would have been an excellent opportunity to use solar power. Not only does the Bethune plant have a large amount of open territory, which would have been ideal for collection, you have plenty of room in there to put uh, energy walls so that you can store the energy and not use a smelly ice diesel, okay? It's an internal combustion engine for those that don't know what ice is. And a technology that is rapidly going to be phased out in the next few years. Uh, obviously, to get a pay pack on a project that's now going to exceed $1.7 million is going to take many, many years. And again, we're missing an opportunity here. The price of solar energy and storage for it has come way down. And the payback is not only in the fact that you'll have the backup power, but you'll also be able to generate power to run a, a good portion, if not all, if properly designed, of the wastewater facility. This will bring our costs down tremendously. It would be long-term payback for the city. Again, this seems like a horribly missed opportunity. And I know, Mr. Merrick, we've talked about let's make Daytona the city of the future. This is exactly the kind of project that would make us the city of the future. So I implore that you consider very highly. I would love to have this whole thing tabled, but I think it's probably too far down the highway now. But please, for any of your future projects, consider solar systems. We, you know, we're in the sunshine state. I've been looking to studies and, and, and uh, looking at the price for doing it for my own home. And let me tell you, there is a payback, and especially for the city, because you can afford to put in a large enough system that will pay you 
each and every month. And that's, that is the city of the future. And we're right here on the beach where, of course, obviously the pollution from diesel generators, which is awful, doesn't follow under the same standards that diesel vehicles do, which is quite high now. So, you know, again, we're dumping huge amounts of hydrocarbons into the air. We're using an old technology that is going to become increasingly obsolete and it's going to be very expensive to maintain. And that's one of the other things. The maintenance factor on solar systems is considerably less than what it is for diesel generator systems. They are a high maintenance system. I used to work on them when I was in the military. We had to keep our communication systems running 24 7 to keep uh, our, our pilots in the sky. And uh, if we had solar back then, it would have been terrific. And this is an excellent opportunity. And again, Mr. Mayor, I, I know you've, we've talked about it before, but let's please make Daytona a city of the future, not a city of the past. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jerice Boyd. Good evening. Um, just a few quick comments on um, items under the F. I mean, 8, 8 B, the study that you are currently doing, thank you very much. I'm not sure if because um, deputy city manager or city manager that's changed, but that is overdue. The second thing is we have the annual tennis um, event coming up on 8 D. And I just wonder if you all have considered bringing in tennis to our city for our children to play because it's not one of the popular sports here, but it's actually very healthy. We're big on football here and basketball, but I think we need to consider it, especially if we're donating to it annually. And then the community rating system, that's the big thing. I think it should be explained to the cities and the citizens and business owners how it exactly works and why our current rating is below average and why what exactly is being done to improve it. Not just say, hey, we're gonna bring it up, but more so break it down. And then the last two items I have, um, the history, the Windsor Apartments, um, my hope, and I'll just say this, is that if it becomes public housing, it does not um, go through the same things that they're going through right now in Seoul City and over there because they have rats and infestation, mold, poor management, horrible um, conditions from what I've known from people who live there and are moving out. So let's just be a different system. Um, hopefully you'll hold them accountable. They are part of us now, and if they're going to inherit this debt, then I think that it should not be inherited unless they're going to do it properly and fix the issues that they do currently have and that other housing projects have had here in our city. And last is just asking, um, on 8J, I know they donated some funds for the um, grant money, but if any of that is also available for others, um, is there a way to communicate that? Thank you. That was my final speaker for the consent agenda. Mr. Mr. Mayor, can I just say that Mrs. McCoy does a fantastic job with our tennis program over at Derbyshire Park. She has done it for years, and she has had up to anywhere up to 100 students at a time, and it's still, it's every, every week she, she runs that program. Actually, I believe the tennis courts over there at Bayberry, they do give lessons to children over there as well. Yes, they and do. And we're not giving money for that tennis we are giving money, but we are making the money back, and we're making a small profit as well. Yeah. Well said. Okay. Uh, we have a motion. We have a second. No. Do we have no motion? Wait. I, I have <laughs> well, a question ahead. with 8, 8C. Mm -hmm. um, we have anybody that can speak on that? I think Andy Holmes is in the back. No, it's David Waller's in the back, I believe. HC? HC was... Uh, Ring power. Ring power purchase order. That was... Michael. Michael. He's in the building, I know. Hi. Hi. I don't know if David knows anything. Okay. I just have a, I just have a question. I'm yes, not an expert, but um, I know this is an older machine that we have here, the backhoe, and it has over 400,000 hours on it, correct? Uh, I think it's... Huh? 4,000. I don't know the total. 400,000. Not 400. I'd have to check to get the. I know it's not okay, 400, well, but we yes, ma'am. It's got a lot of hours in it, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's quite oh, wait, old. 4,600 hours. Yeah, that's okay. Quite, yeah. <laughs> okay, it has a lot of hours on it. Okay, and they could not find a um, replacement engine. Correct. So, and it's been the, down for about six months or so. Okay. So the 36000 is to tear it apart and try to rebuild it. 
are we guaranteed that they're going to have be able to find the parts to rebuild the engine? They have, they yes, understanding through fleet is that they have an engine that they can get to bring in as new to the repair that can get it back up to the, to our spec that we need, mm -hmm. and the, and a new unit is over a hundred thousand dollars, so that'll that'll put us back in the system where we need to be in order to do our work without having to buy a new unit. Okay. Well, the reason I had the question, my son has this business <laughs> in Crane, and I know they start replacing it after so many hours, and this is an older machine. And I just want to make sure we won't waste in any money and if we shouldn't be buying a new machine because no. it is older. We, so. we, based on our input from fleet, they believe that this unit still has a lot of useful life other than the engine. The rest of the equipment is in pretty good shape. And uh, we are, we do run less hours per year than a commercial operator just because of the way we operate. That machine doesn't go out every day. So we think that this is a, a good, good opportunity to not spend the full value. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, sir. I have a question about 8B, please. <clears throat> e? B. B. So it's more of a comment. When we do the uh, study, I'm hoping, and I'm sure you will, but I want to have it on the record, that we document where our current um, affordable housing is located, if we can tell us where those units are, um, and roughly how much they're paying per unit for rent in those areas. If they could divide it up by zones, that would be great as opposed to just an entire number. And my interest is specifically in zone three. Thank you. Uh, I would like that as well. That was uh, brought up at our neighborhood watch. They'd like to know exactly what affordable housing is available in zone five. So it would be good to know. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, if I might, the specs call for location, identification of affordable housing supply. I think the request the commission is making, if in fact that's the assent of the commission, is something that can be added to the directions given to the consultant to locate it by zones and try to get some cost information as well. Okay. And then if that's the assent of the commission, that will yeah. be included in the direction. No, no, no objection. The All assumption right. I'm making is that when we do the subtraction, we'll also find out what the, we'll know from Larry Bartlett, what is property that's homesteaded and then we should know what market rate is. He's going to tell us market rate also, correct, in the area? So we can do a comparison of what's market rate versus what's affordable. Is that possible? Commissioner, I think that it is, and if the commission agrees, I'd be happy to sit down with you outside this and get the instructions that you want to have put I, in there. I, I think this should have been done long before tonight. Just this should, You should have made this input. We've had this on the table for quite a while. So well, we didn't uh, even know who it was going to be, though. We didn't have to know who it was going to be to know what our okay. specs were. Sure, but for months I've been asking him the same question every single week. I've been saying, asking, when are we getting the study? You didn't have to say when were we getting the study. You had to say what you wanted from the study. Is it an issue That's to what ask you're what, tonight. Is it an issue to ask how much market it, rate we actually it, have? It, it is an issue if it causes further delay. Will it they, cause delay, well, then? I, I don't know, but let me, let me finish my point. Tonight, what we're voting on is what they've brought us as a proposal that they've already gone to the consultant. So now if they go back to the consultant and they add more specs to the proposal, the consultant may have to add more money to it. And so I'm simply going to say, I, I don't care what you ask for. You could have asked for a sea of information as it relates to affordable housing. But I'm simply going to say that if it causes a delay, and I don't know if it approves the rest, then I, I, don't, I don't approve of that. Mm -hmm. And if that's up to everyone else, but I don't want any more delays. So I'm not over a year on this. So multiple times in conversation, you've used the phrase delay as it pertains to me specifically as a commissioner, more than once, more than twice, and more than three times. Mm -hmm. So my request is, if it's possible, to get accurate information, complete information, so that we're not working with partial information, then I would like to see if that is something we can get done. It's not completely up to me, but she's made a request. You meet with her, but I, as long as it doesn't affect the bottom line of us being able to come back, then I'm okay with it. I, I just, so whatever I, it is that she needs in there, I want you to have your information. But I just am saying, and I will always say, when something is getting kicked down the road, if I see it as a delay, 
I'm simply going to say it just as I see it. And the phrase kick down the road, again, that is not the point here. The point is that in zone three, and I'm putting that on the record, we have copious amounts of affordable housing. You have what? What's copious, that? plentiful amounts. Okay. We'll make sure right? I hear that. Uh, mm -hmm affordable housing, workforce housing. We have different apartments that are for seniors on fixed incomes in zone three. And I would like to know, given that, are we getting more in zone three? Or do we have enough market rate? Because that also impacts some of our downtown areas. And that's what I'd like to know. I'd like to see a comparison and where those units are gonna go. Okay, I'm, hap I'm happy to hear you make that statement as to what you want you. and to the fact that you feel as though there's plenty of affordable housing in zone three. Thank you for clarifying. Mayor, if I, if I might add, I don't believe that request is outside of the scope of the work to be done. Um, in particular, the scope requires that the consultant provide a general location map of existing housing stock. Uh, so I, I think that'll be covered within the work to be done. So it's already covered. It's already in there. Wonderful. Didn't, we didn't have to ask. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Understood, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Do we have any other questions or comments? All right, we have a motion yet? No. Nope. Are they entertaining a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Reed. We'll take a second from Commissioner Henry. Um, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those who are opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. Okay, we're going to move on to item number nine, which is our public hearings. Item 9A is the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Project Zeta, Large Scale Comprehensive Plan Amendment. This is an ordinance on second reading public hearing. An ordinance adopting comprehensive plan amendments in accordance with Chapter 163, Part 2, Florida Statute, in relation to 23.2 plus or minus acres of land, generally located approximately 2,500 feet northeast of the intersection of West International Speedway Boulevard and LPJ Boulevard, amending the future land use map designation of 5.3 plus or minus acres of the subject property from level one residential to mixed use, amending the future land use designation of 10.9 plus or minus acres of the subject property from level two residential to mixed use, amending the future land use designation of seven plus or minus acres of the subject property from office transition to mixed use, amending the future land use element neighborhood U development policy with regard to the subject property, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances and conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. So moved. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Cantu and a second from Commissioner May. And I do have Ms. Jessica Gao here on behalf of the applicant for any questions. No questions. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those who are in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those who are opposed, same sign. <clears throat> Motion carries 6-0. Okay. Moving on to 9B, it's the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Project Zeta, Rezoning Plan Development General. This is an ordinance on second reading, quasi-judicial hearing. An ordinance amending the zoning map of the Land Development Code to rezone 23.2 acres of property, generally located approximately 2,500 feet northeast of the intersection of West International Speedway Boulevard and LPGA Boulevard, from single family residential five, SFR five, to PDG, Plan Development General, approving the Project Zeta Plan District Agreement, authorizing development of the property with a variety of residential and non-residential principal uses and certain additional temporary uses, subject conditions, authorizing the mayor and the city clerk to execute the agreement, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances and conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Cantu and a second from Commissioner Henry. Do have any questions or comments from the speakers? I do have Jessica Gao here on behalf of the applicant. No other speakers. All right. Motion and a second. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those who are opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Moving on to item 9C, it's the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Peabody Historic Overlay Rezoning. This is an ordinance on second reading, quasi-judicial hearing. An ordinance amending the zoning map of the Lands of Illinois Code, applying the historic overlay classification to the site of the Peabody Auditorium, located at 600 Auditorium Boulevard, which is owned by the City of Daytona Beach, adopting design guidelines for the site, directing that the local register of historic places be updated to include the site, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. So I'll move. Second. Uh, we have a motion from Commissioner Traeger and a second from Commissioner Reed. And I have no speakers on this item, Mr. Mayor. 
Do we have any questions or comments from the commission? Hearing none, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those who are opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. Okay, moving on to 9-D. It's the Development and Administrative Services Anti-Discrimination Income Source. This is an ordinance on second reading public hearing. An ordinance creating sections 5426, 5429 of Chapter 54 of the Code of Ordinances to prohibit source of income discrimination in the rental of residential dwelling units within the city and to provide for enforcement and penalties and to provide an effective date. I, I have a few questions. Okay. 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 Um, I agree with you at the last commission meeting. I don't believe anyone should be being discriminated against mm -hmm. at all for where they're getting their money. Mike. Oh. Mike. Oh. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Okay. So at the last commission meeting, I do agree with you. I don't believe anyone should be discriminated where the money is coming from, unless it's drug money, of course. But And I didn't know much about the vouchers um, to Commissioner Henry had said a few things, and so I actually did my own homework. Otherwise, I would have came forward at the last commission because I do have a few concerns. Mm -hmm. um, um, we are protecting a certain certain people out there, but I don't feel like we are actually protecting the um, property owners as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there needs to be a few tweaks in there because let's say we have a, um, looking at the housing authority, um, their protocol and the applications and everything, and let's say that a property, and right now we have some property owners that are depending on their rent to pay their mortgage, especially because of COVID. And we have a property owner, let's say they're going through the process with the housing authority. And sometimes that housing authority, I found out, can take a while, like maybe 30 days. So in the meantime, their property is sitting there while they're trying to get um, approved. The renters are trying to get approved, so the property owners are having to wait. And I feel like if someone else comes forward in that 30 days while they're waiting, has the cash up front, they should be allowed to rent their property without waiting. So I feel like we need some tweaking in there. Um, and I, I had talked to you, and there was a word maybe delay, because I want to make sure we're protecting the renters and the property owners as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean... And then I do have a few other things. Um, being in real estate as well, I personally like it because my money is guaranteed. So, but there might be other people that do not like this. And so I feel like that we, we are all up here wanting to help with affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that we could have, this could backfire on us where some of the property owners um, might go the market rate way high because they don't want to deal with it. So then we're hurting other property, I mean, people that are trying to rent because they're going to go sky high because they don't want to deal with the application or anything. I just feel like maybe having a workshop to try to tweak this a little bit mm -hmm. so we're protecting both or it's just maybe a meeting. And I feel like we, some, okay, Personally, there might be some people that don't follow city government as well. And so we are putting this ordinance in, and then this owner, this property owner, might not know they're not in compliance. So maybe having a meeting, getting the word out that we are doing this and sending this all to all of our realtors out there so they are aware of what we are doing as well. So they are in compliance with the ordinance. I mean... This is just my feeling. I'm mean, being in real estate, and I do like it. I just feel that w there has to be some tweaking so the property owners are protected as well. Mm -hmm. According to the Fifth Amendment, you have life, liberty, and your property. So, and there is something else I feel that could happen. I mean, where the property owner could actually sue the city, and I've had talks with him, but it would probably be two, three thousand dollars. So the city, it wouldn't really matter to the city. But we could have landlord class action suits happening too. So we have to feel, we have to protect the property owner as well. But what might what might a class action suit be about in this case? 
um, a class oh. action suit where we, government, is overreaching um, and telling pretty much the property owner what they have to do. They have to go fill out all that paperwork and wait for 30 days mm -hmm. with the property sitting there when they have other people that want to rent their property, why, that, why they're sitting there waiting. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like there's some tweaking that we need to do just to make sure we are not overstepping the prop property owner as well as the renters. I, I agree that, certainly I agree that um, property rights are among the most protected rights you know, in our Constitution, rightfully so. Um, and I do agree with the issue of competition, that a seller shouldn't have to really be delayed because of bureaucracy. And that's basically what I guess could happen in the scenario that you described. Um, the other components of your, you know, um, I don't want to call it an argument, but you know, your position, um, I'm not sure I, I, I agree with it in terms of our inability to, to move forward tonight. Let me see. Well, Is there a way for you to? I'm, to, I want to just say one thing, mm -hmm. okay? So race, gender, religion, national origin, origin, disability are a few things that are constitution protected. Mm -hmm. But not having enough money is not one of them. So government can cause a financial burden without compensating the property owner, which is called taking, taking. Um, I'm, Jagger, I'm sure, is very familiar mm -hmm. with that. So I just want to make sure we are doing everything that are protecting the property owners and the renters as well. And like I said, I am not disagreeing. I do not feel that anyone should be discriminated with how they are paying their bills at all. Mm -hmm. Because I personally like it because I know I'm guaranteed the money. But we do have property owners that might not like this ordinance. And I just want to make sure both We do. We, we definitely have. We have property owners who simply don't like it because they don't want to rent to people. Correct. Or, and for whatever other reason, it may be because of delay. I'm trying to figure out how we can get to a, a, a conclusion, even if it's not tonight and it had to be brought back. You want to opine on this in any way as it relates to, is there a way to Im implement something that would eliminate their, uh, because I show up and I, I shouldn't have to make them wait 30 days. Is there a way to get around that? First? Yes, yes, and, mm -hmm. and certainly that was the intent. So as you recall, the original draft on this ordinance um, created an ordinance violation if there was discrimination based on the source of income, uh, but also if there was discrimination because of the requirements of the public assistance program. So we went back, we redrafted that so that the intent being the landlord would not be punished if there were some out-of-pocket costs. In other words, that would not be discrimination to refuse to rent to a tenant who happens to have um, housing choice vouchers, but the housing choice, housing choice program required the landlord to, to either waive rents or reduce uh, their rents or to incur some costs to, um, to rehabilitate the property. So we redrafted, uh, we expressly state that those types of, of um, circumstances are not violations. So the suggestion that uh, Commissioner Cantu had was to add to that language uh, to um, more expressly provide that a delay in rents would not amount to a violation. So if I could read that to everyone and then we can discuss the actual language and see if it, it suits Cantu's issues and meets um, you know, the requirements of the rest of the commission. Mm -hmm. So uh, the language as revised then would say, it uh, shall not be a violation of this section for a landlord to refuse to rent a unit where the public assistance program requires a landlord to reduce, we'll add the word delay, or waive rents, or other lease related fees such as security deposits, or where the public assistance program requires a landlord to conduct repairs, maintenance, or improvements to the lease premises that exceed applicable provisions of the land development code, including the property maintenance code or the requirements of this code. So in other words, those are two situations which are not violations if you have to reduce, waive, or delay receipt of rents, or if you have to conduct 
improvements to the site beyond what our code would require, our property maintenance code would require. So, um, and, and actually, I like that, and I think that will help protect. The only other thing I would like is maybe bring it back at the next commission with that and give notice to all of our realtors out there what we are doing so everybody is in compliance. And there was one other thing that was brought to me, and um, actually she's here tonight, and I got the email late. I like some of the incentives that was done in different um, counties, it looks like, with this, and um, where they were offering a $200 bonus to the landlord or landlords who have not who have not participated in the last two years or returning. I think maybe if we gave some incentives as well to these homeowners, um, I don't know if the housing authority does this or if the city, um, I think Trinity would have to speak on that more, but I think it would help because we do have property owners that are gonna, their market, they're gonna raise their market rate and it's gonna hurt even our other ones that are not doing the vouchers because they just don't want to deal with the paperwork on it, because we are making proper, the property owner deal with the paperwork. So I just, I, I like that, that's perfect, but I would like to get the word out as well. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that, but there has to be a way without us having to go beyond tonight, is that we can't add anything to it, huh? Oh, no, you can. Okay. Certainly you yeah, could add the delay. that, that one word delay to the language, okay. uh, and I will make that change if so directed. But we have to, she's saying that it's the city's responsibility to educate realtors in town about this new yeah, rule. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think we, we have to wait a month. I just think we need to get it out there to them if we have to have a meeting or send out something to them just to let them know because, I mean, if you're not in city government, how do you know... Yeah. It, you're in compliance and mm -hmm. you're renting and you tell these people no or whatever. We need to let the people know what we're doing. Yeah. I heard that argument uh, right. somewhere on the radio or somewhere where people were concerned that they would be in violation of something that they weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a way of uh, addressing this in terms of us educating our our community. We, we can work through the <coughs> we can work through the PR section to have them help publicize it and do what they think is appropriate to publicize it further if the ordinance is passed tonight. And I am not clear on whether or not there's going to be an additional amendment to the language tonight or not. Uh, but regardless, Whatever. when it's passed, it will yes, sir, it can be done. Okay. Another option for you, of course, you can <coughs> delay approval, but uh, you could also delay the effective date of the ordinance if you want. I was thinking time. that. Okay. I'm thinking delay the effective date of the ordinance because it's not a rush. We haven't had it in mm -hmm. 50 years, so uh, however how long. I, I just want it to happen. Mm -hmm. Just delay it to a reasonable amount of time so that then they will know that this is coming. Gives you our, our offices an opportunity to yes, educate. Sir. You can pick a time period, 90 days. I'm thinking January 1. Pardon me? Sounds good. I'm thinking January 1. Yes, ma'am. That sounds good for you, three months? That's fine. Um, and the other question, what happens if someone's not in compliance? So this will be enforced as all of our code enforcement matters are enforced through either the magistrate, the code board, or the county court. It is a, um, well, you know how all that works. So yeah. it, if it's, it, this would be an irreper irreparable type of fine. So they would issue a, a fine. There wouldn't be an opportunity to cure, in other words. Okay. Um, so the board would issue attorney, a fine. Would we win this? Because would we win what? Win this. If we're trying to put this ordinance in compliance and they hire an attorney. We prosecute hundreds of code cases every month. Uh, I understand yes. this, but this is not actually a state. This is a federal program that we are implementing an ordinance. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to find out, mm -hmm. would we win this? I'd and what would happen if we had a landlord class action suit? So let me try to clarify a few things. Unlike... I know the Constitution, there is a law finish. taking, taking, because we're not compensated. Compensa so unlike the Fair Housing Act, this does not create an independent cause of action on behalf of a discriminated tenant. So that tenant cannot sue the landlord or the city uh, for discrimination. This is simply an ordinance violation. 
and it'll go to the code board or the magistrate or the county court as all of our cases do and it'll be up to the court to look at the facts or the magistrate etc to look at the facts for that particular case and determine whether or not source of income discrimination occurred and if so they'll issue a fine or a penalty accordingly okay. um, so uh, as I said do I think we'll win those cases I, I think if given the right facts, we will win those cases. Given the wrong facts, then people should, of course, not be found guilty. Uh, if, if the landlord is able to prove that, that the program requires him to do something beyond standard code requirements for maintenance or rehabilitation, then that should not be a violation. And, and if a, so they can't use taking or take in whatever. I don't see a taking case arising out of this, honestly, but, but that's not to say and that you know someone I couldn't sue us. I'm not sure what you're looking at. This was the incentives. That's why, because the property owner is not being compensated at all. And taking, I feel, because mm. I think they could use that case. So your code is designed to avoid any sort of financial impact to the landlord. And if, if that goal is achieved, there should be no taking. Okay. So... Uh, I spoke with Ms. Trinity earlier today, and I asked her to send to the commission the list of the compensations that we could, ways we could actually not, uh, ways that we could help landlords, encourage them to want to willingly participate in the program. So I'm glad she sent them. Thank you, Ms. Trinity. So to that end, I do recall that Housing Authority gave a, a stipend, an incentive to homeowners to allow housing vouchers, to encourage them to, I think the fee was $400. They had a huge campaign a few months back. And my question is, something for the commission to consider in the future is that we could maybe use part of our CARES funding for that, um, to help offset it, to encourage landlords to participate in this program. And the fee that they used was 400. I believe in some of the documentation I received research, it was 200. But the response, I believe, was overwhelmingly positive when we did that. Just a thought. Well, I, I, I would support any commissioner that wanted to use their CARES funds for that. I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. If a person wants to rent a home and uh, somebody comes with a voucher, now do they have to fill out uh, to be in that program if they don't want to be in the program? They have to fill out all that information. The and while they're authority. waiting, somebody else wants mm -hmm. With the money in hand, wants to rent, can they rent to that that's person? That's what we were just discussing with the way. Yeah, well, that's. Correct. Well, that's why he's going to change that. So. Oh, my God. Sorry. That's why he said. You know, didn't he change it. So I'm going to end. Because I'm afraid that some people will maybe take their homes or something off the market, maybe sell it instead of well, renting it, and really diminish the amount of affordable housing we have because of all the um, government red tape they have to go through. Right, and that's what I was talking. Being in real estate, the, the market value, they're going to, people that don't want to participate, our market value, they're just going to raise it, and I think it's going to hurt us in the long run. That's my personal opinion, because if they don't want to go fill out all that paperwork or anything, they're just going to raise the rent. And so that's going to hurt other people that are not doing the vouchers as well. That's my feeling personally, but because we are trying to help with affordable housing. So I, I just feel that it might hurt. And I know right now people are selling their houses right now um, because the market rate is high. So they're selling their houses and they are renting places right now. So the market value drops and they made money. So um, I, ju I personally think this is the wrong time to be doing it just because, but I mean, I think, I, I think it, this would help at some point, but I don't believe right now with the market rate going up and people are selling their house to rent right now. I'll let Bob address her issue and then I wanna give my opinion on this issue of, um, you know, costs. You know, we live in a, this is capitalism, so it's a competitive market. Right. Go ahead, Bob. All right, so Commissioner Traeger, as I understand what you're, the issue you're raising is, the question is whether if a, a landlord um, was waiting on the Section 8 or Housing Choice uh, program uh, requirements, such as 
the inspection and the approvals and so on. And if during that time there was a another tenant that came forward and was able to start immediately, would that be a violation? The way we've drafted this, this that would not be a violation. So that landlord could take that non-Section 8 tenant um, in order to avoid the delay for the for the Section 8 tenant. Thank That's you. not until you change it, correct? Well, we're going to add the word delay right. to it, assuming, be, yes. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like first come, first serve. Yeah. Right. You know, they're not denying the one with the voucher, but if someone is standing there with money in their hand, I mean, you're a renter, you want to rent your property. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. Now, and also, if they're in the process of that and someone comes, they can say, okay, you have the money. Right. Yes. So we're, they're protected. Right. Um, okay. It, this is a free market. So I don't believe that people are renting homes at a reduced value so that people will rent them. I think they're renting them at the cost of whatever they their value is. And the same is true as it relates to when they sell them. Uh, you know, so if they take the house off the market and they sell it, they're only going to sell it for what it's worth, and that's all they're going to get. You know, hopefully sometime in the future they get less than what we're getting right now because we all know that the cost of housing is, you know, I think we're almost on another bubble. You are getting more for your property right now yeah. than you would normally get for you right now. That's why people are selling, and the shortage of housing right now, even for buyers, is very, very low right now. Yeah. But I just don't believe that this is going to make people elevate their price. I think they're already at the price that they can afford or that, they, that, that it will sell for. So I just don't think that this is going to adversely affect that. Uh, but that's just my opinion. Okay. Do we have any other comments on this item? We have speakers. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do we have those before we started talking? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. because someone must have asked to go find. Go ahead. Our first speaker is Trinity is it Kaczynski. Okay. And on deck is Sharice Boyd. Mayor and Commissioners, my name is Trinity Kaczynski, and um, my address is 340 North Maitland Avenue, Maitland, Florida, 32751. Um, did have public comment prepared, but I was wondering if I could use this to ask um, a few questions or maybe just kind of expand on some of the discussion that was had um, by the commission a few minutes ago. Uh, you okay. can use your time to say what you have. And, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, like I said, thank you for the opportunity to, to provide public comment. Um, again, I am the public affairs director at the Apartment Association of Greater Orlando, and that's who I'm here on behalf of today. We represent housing providers. Um, throughout uh, Volusia County and um, with a large contingent who own and operate in the city of Daytona Beach. Um, we appreciate the revisions that you guys made to the ordinance um, and we shared those revisions with um, some of our Daytona Beach um, owners and operators. And um, as we shared with you, um, they had a few comments, questions, and concerns. Um, we compiled those, like I said, and shared those with you. and. Um, the most common touched on uh, topics regarding administrative requirements, housing accessibility and attainability, inspections and housing quality standards, as well as property insurance, public assistance program participation thre thresholds. Um, so with the word delay where it's being um, inserted into the ordinance, our concerns there would have to do with not so much them being in compliance with the ordinance if they if they choose not to participate um, based on having to hold that unit vacant. Them holding that unit vacant during that um, request for tenancy approval process with the housing authority is a requirement of the Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, so <laughs> our worry there would be that there would be some sort of um, fair housing violation or potential for a fair housing violation on the part of the housing housing provider with deciding, oh, okay, I'm going to rent to someone else who, you know, just expressed interest, although I'm in the middle of the, this process. Um, so I, I wasn't sure if you had any um, feedback or um, an answer to provide in terms of that. Um, 
Mayor, would you like me to respond? I would like, I would like to hear. <laughs> All right. So that is obviously a private matter, if you will, between the housing authority requirements and the landlord. So um, I can't really speak to that. It's not addressed in our ordinance. What all that our ordinance would provide that is if the landlord is required to waive their rent or delay their rent or reduce their rent, then that would not be a violation. Okay. Um, yeah, I get, you know, like, I guess just to kind of expand on a, a larger sweeping concern is the fact that this is a voluntary um, federal program that, um, you know, housing providers have the option or you know choice to participate in. Um, and like I said, mainly the uh, fair housing violations and uh, that additional liability and risk that the housing providers are incurring in trying to comply both with the ordinance or you know potentially perhaps not have to participate in the um, housing choice voucher program, other public assistance program. Um, and then, yeah, I, I guess those are those are our main concerns. And like I said, um, you know, as I've reiterated, I know I went over my uh, time here, uh, so I thank you. We're <laughs> your, your time's up. Okay. Thank well, you. thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Sharice Boyd, and on deck is John Nicholson. Okay. So the concern I have from being a property manager and being in low-income tax credit property, the issue is. If, and just so y'all know this, and I'm not an attorney, but I can tell you what the HUD housing paperwork is. When you go in and fill out, it already takes about 30 days to get an application. But even if you're not in HUD and you're a regular apartment like the Groves, once you sign your intent, they can't take it from you while you're in the process. Now, they usually have a time frame that you got to complete everything within 30 calendar days or whatever, because they too, it would operate the same except with HUD. If you're under something, they can't say, oh, well, someone brought cash, and now I'm not going to do it. Just so you know, they just can't do it because they know that the process with HUD or Section 8, et cetera, does take time. Next is, um, I agree with you, and that would be a concern that they will raise their rent, um, and a lot of people are doing it now. And next, it's really not voluntary, although she said it, it's a federal program, so if someone brings it, they don't actually voluntarily have to. Um, voluntarily, they actually have to commit to filling out the paperwork and going through the process. What I think will happen, and this is what I've experienced from being in this, one, property owners, they, it's easy money. It's a government. It's a check every month, so they get it. And what they do is they start slacking off on those properties, and they do mistreat the less fortunate. They really do. Um, not all, but a good portion of them will. They won't keep up with the repairs. So if they're going to do this, my goal or my concern would be that you all make sure that it's not an annual um, checkup. There needs to be some kind of hotline number for people who do qualify for the housing and get in there and reach out to the city because... We're following the ordinance to report to you all and that y'all be adamant in following up on those, just like you do for businesses and code violations. Because I've seen it, they get abused, um, they're neglected, and you'll see things. But my concern next is, and this has nothing to do with y'all because you all are implementing a federal program, but in regards to the code, yes, that's what you should implement. My concern is if, the, um, if you don't get it out to the realtor soon enough, people may get in violation, and that will be a concern. So is there going to be, even though you say maybe January, 30 days, I think you do need a window of time or some kind of forgiveness for the first offense because people, no one's just not going to know, even if they're on social media, they don't come to these meetings or they're not really concerned or they're not active. Someone may rent for a friend. Hey, I'm a realtor. Oh, yeah, I can get your property sent, and they don't know those changes. Now, if it's federal, it'll come down the tunnel, hopefully, or the windpipe or whatever, and it'll go out to the people. But the biggest concern for me is they're not going to keep up the property. Um, people are going to kind of know that their houses aren't the best, and they'll do the bare, min bare minimum. And I actually had a lady call me from Deland, um, a doctor in education, who said she went to go rent a house, and this is important that y'all see this, that when they went to rent the house, the house looked really phenomenal. But when she got inside, it looked great. She opened the refrigerator. It was molded. It was nasty. And although they're required to have a house, they're not actually implementing the standards for the utilities. So that's another concern that will, I mean, not the utilities, the um, appliances. So thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question based on what Ms. Boyd just said. If the housing authority is the one that's renting these, are they the ones that are going to be doing the checks or does this fall up under our rental property checks? So it could be both. Uh, the okay. housing authority under their uh, programming, they do inspections uh, for compliance with their standards. Uh, and those are done prior to the rental and annually as well on, uh, for renewals. Um, in addition to that, the city has a rental housing ordinance that applies to 
rentals of less than five units. And uh, for those, you have to get a license from the city and they have to go through a city inspection to ensure that they're up to code as well. Mm -hmm. And how often are, are our inspections? I think that's an annual permit. It is an annual permit. Okay. Yeah. But I have a question now since she just asked that one. So they come annually to inspect that and let's say the place is torn apart. Who's responsible, the housing authority or the property owner? If it's a code violation because they're not I mean, our the code. I mean, the inside is just torn apart. Then never we're going to cite them under our code. We are going to cite the, yes. but they don't have the money anyway. <laughs> right. So. If they don't meet the housing authority requirements, then the housing authority won't give them the voucher. So that's <laughs> between, again, that's between the landlord and the housing authority. But if they're not up to city code, they'll be cited. No. What I'm saying, let's say they've been there a whole year. Housing authority comes in, checks, and the place is torn up. Right. Now, is the property owner the one that has to fix everything and has to pay for it, or is the housing authority going to be the one that has to fix and pay for everything? So if the question is whether or not it would be discrimination for the landlord then to, to not rent to that tenant, um, again, it would be have to look at it case by case. Okay. If the requirements of the housing authority go beyond the city's code, then that would not be discrimination. Okay. Sort of, but I thought she was asking well, if the if and tell me if I'm correct, if the tenant were to tear the property up, who would be responsible? Oh, okay. So yes, if so, if a tenant tears up the property, that violates the lease. So the landlord doesn't lose any of their rights under the lease. If and, and of course, you know, a, a tenant can be turned down because they don't pass a credit check or they don't pass a background check. If they violate the lease or they tear up the property, the landlord's under no obligation to renew that lease because of our code. But you still haven't answered the question. Uh, maybe I don't understand it yet. Who's responsible for the repairs? Oh, the, the is tenant. it going to be the landlord or is it going to be the, the housing authority? It's a private cause, cause of action between the landlord and the tenant. And it's the same as if any other person rented the property and did that. Doesn't matter, you know, whoever uh, rents it. Yeah, you tell somebody. Okay. You we have another speaker. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is John Nicholson, and on deck is Ann Ruby. John Nicholson, 413 North Granby Avenue. Uh, every time I turn around, there's another question and another question. Everything that you answer brings another question. Basically, is there a need for this? I've never understood why there's a need. This is a guaranteed income, and those people that want guaranteed income, this is perfect for them because you're guaranteed an income for a year, and that's fantastic. I've been renting for, what, 40 years, and I don't know anybody that's always got their rent, all right? Secondly, who wants to wait? When I put an ad in the paper... I don't ever go with the first person that comes along because you never know. So I always wait a week to find out which is the best candidate. So to me, who in their right mind would wait a month or longer to get a tenant when there are other people coming constantly? And there are times in, in cycles where you get 10 or 20 people in the first week. And there are parts of the year, especially off season, you're not finding anybody because they're not looking for, for renters. So um, I'm, I'm worried about the, the cost to the landlords. You all don't understand that if you get somebody in and you're doing the Section 8 housing or whatever, and the per, their perception is that you're prejudiced against them, mm -hmm. who pays for the lawyer? Who pays for the eviction? All of that goes on the landlord. Who pays for the repairs? It's the landlord. When I wanted to evict somebody one time, they had stopped paying rent. It cost 375 to a victim. Then you have to pay the uh, court cost. I mean, uh, the um, sheriff to come out. It's a very expensive thing to... to yeah, it's a lot more now. So it, it really, what you're doing is you're, you're tying the hands of the property owners. It's really something that I don't see the need for. I understand your idea that uh, somebody with a voucher should be able to, to go wherever they want to go. All right? There are people that need this income, and they're going to take that money. I don't understand uh, what the, all the, uh, the, the problem is about. I, I don't see the need for, to have this uh, in law. If somebody wants to rent to somebody, fine. If they don't want to, fine. 
Mm -mm. Uh, and I, I know uh, I'm against the law now, but I would not rent when I started to anybody with tattoos or uh, pierced earrings. I just didn't rent to them. You all right. Nowadays, you can't do that anymore. All right. Uh, gender, you can't do it by gender, which makes doesn't make a sense. An 85 year old woman, why would she want a, a gentleman there? She should be able to say she wants a female renter. I don't see anything wrong with that. If you're a female, then you want a female. So I, I have a problem with a lot of these things. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Miss Ruby. Ruby. And our next speaker is Miss Ann Ruby. Well, wait. Please help. Us. Ruby, 137 Park Avenue. I just wanted to point out a plain old nuts and bolts thing. You're talking about how do we notify landlords? If they have units small enough, they are licensed through the city. If they're large units, they're licensed through the state. It is very easy to find out who are the landlords and to contact them. So I think setting it at January 1st, there is plenty of time to figure out who the landlords are and get in touch. I think that concern is kind of by the books, by the side. Okay. Thank you very kindly. Do we have any other questions or comments? I do. I have a comment. And it sounds to me as though um, these things can happen with any tenant. It does not have to be a Section 8 person. And it sounds to me like a little bit of poor shaming in terms of uh, Section 8 tenants are these horrible people and, and the premise is that they're just going to come in and tear up, up these up these uh, places. Well, first, first thing that I know about most Section 8 people is that um, the housing authority in Section 8 is so strenuous that even minor scrapes on the wall can make you lose your contract with them. So um, I just want us to be mindful that it just sounds to me as though we're, it's these Section 8 people are just horrible people. They just may come in and just tear up everybody's property. Anybody can come in and tear up your property. Um, you don't have to be a Section 8 person. You can be a, a person with a six-figure income and come in and tear up people's property. And it's been done. And, and if a person is angry enough or mad enough at a, at a, a, at a, at the person who owns the, owns the home, they'll tear it up as well. So there are various reasons and various people who will come in and tear up people's property. So I don't think that we should just sit here and, and say, what if, what if, what if. I think we're, we're knocking this thing down based upon a whole bunch of what ifs. Um, I'm going to support it tonight. Mm -hmm. I, I actually agree with you. But renting out property, I've had, I, I've never done the vouchers, and yes, I've done evictions, and it, it's costly trying to get them out, and most of them, they know the process, because sometimes it takes three to four months to get someone out, because most of them are, <laughs> are pros at it, mm -hmm. um, and I do not feel like we should discriminate. The only thing I want it is fear to the property owner, because they made that investment. It's their property. They should be allowed to do what they want to do with their own property. Mm -hmm. I do not want someone telling me how, I mean, I get tired of HOAs telling me what I have to do in my property, but I live in a HOA, so I have to follow the rules. But I just, I just feel like we need to protect everyone across the board. And um, like I said, it, I, I wouldn't mind doing vouchers because I know I'm getting my money. Um, but I just want to make sure if the property owner is renting, like if we put the word delay, if we put that in there and they're waiting for the process, the, if it takes 30 days and someone comes between that 30 days and says, hey, I have the money, I want to rent your property, and the property owner wants to, wants to do it, they are able to do it. And that will help them. The thing is just that I don't want to see a whole bunch of big um, properties like 300 and 400 place um, apartment buildings just coming together because they just don't want to do this. They just don't want to be accountable, held accountable for not accepting uh, vouchers or discriminating against people. And Commissioner Henry, um, yeah. I just don't think we can even stop that. I mean, am Well, I this is right? a step because, in the right direction right, to me. Because we can't tell someone, a property owner, how much they can rent. That's why. No, no, I, no, no. This isn't ahead. about how much you can rent for. But that's why I think we need incentives. 
you can rent for it, even with Section 8. I mean, you can rent for what you're going to rent for uh, because that person is going to have to pay the difference either way. This, right. is, I, I this is how much your voucher is going to be for. you're saying that you don't want the... I, I, don't want, right. I don't want big complexes just coming together and saying, hey, let's just come up with a whole bunch of reasons as to why this can't be successful because we don't want to do it. We, we don't want to... This is something that we don't want to uh, be held accountable for. And, and, and of that. course, it, I brought up concerns at last meeting with regards to um, making sure the property owners were protected as well. That was my main, that was one of my main concerns as well. Um, and I understand you want it fair and you want it balanced. And I too want it fair and balanced as well. But um, I just think that we, we have to be mindful that we cannot um, just allow big complexes to come in and say, we don't want to do this, so let's go in and talk about how horrible all of these things are, and have you thought about this, and have you thought about that? Yes, I've thought about all of those things, and yes, I still want you to be responsible enough and be fair enough to not discriminate against people. I don't think we can control that, could we? Well, didn't we have a discussion at one point that said, when we have new um, construction, we're going to ask them to have a percentage of it to be and that just went affordable out housing? Window. Uh, we did. No, no, that's why we have the, that's why we did what we did earlier with the uh, RFP, or that's not an RFP, but where we're going to do the, what is it, what did we just do? The study. The affordable the housing study. Affordable study. Affordable what did we just do? Losing my head. An affordable housing study. The, one of the main purposes is to enable us to be able to, to do that, okay. but we can't and do it yet. And, and we also just adopted uh, affordable housing incentives at, mm -hmm. I believe, your last meeting, uh, right. which allowed density bonuses for affordable mm -hmm. housing new construction. Yeah. And so uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question. Housing. What was yeah, the question again? The question I had, what Commissioner Henry said, we have these all these apartment complexes coming together. I do not see where there's any way of stopping that. If even the, with an ordinance, and that's where I was talking about landlords' class action suits coming our way. Again, this ordinance won't create a cause of or action taking. for anybody, or a taking, in my opinion. Um, and it would address a you know a large um, a large development that rents a large rental development, I should say. It would address a policy that says that we will not rent to housing choice vouchers. Uh, because we don't like their administrative requirements. That would be a violation of the code as it's drafted. However, mm -hmm. if they choose not to rent because it costs them money or delays their rent or they have to reduce their rent, that's not a violation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's just, it's exactly what it's called. It's the source of income. If my money's good money, you got to take my money. And rather, it's city, we might incentivize apartments. They could then say, we don't want those cities, the city money, to help incentivize for low-income residents or whatever to make up the difference. And we may come, you know, just never know. So I think that if a person has good money, you should take their money and should be compelled to do so. And this closes the loophole that enables people to do that. And I think we're achieving that. Do we have any other questions? Are you willing to take care? I said earlier that any commissioner that wants to bring to the table to use their CARES money, I would support that. Hmm. Okay. Yes, I would absolutely support any commissioner that wants to do that. Okay. Did we have a motion? No, no we did one. not. <laughs> Do we have a motion? So I would ask that the motion reflect the two changes we've talked about to insert the word delay as discussed and to have an effective date uh, January 1st, 2022. <clears throat> All right, we have a motion, we have a second, and we've had a great discussion that I, I appreciate actually. I think a lot got accomplished out of it. Um, motion and a second. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries six zero. Okay. Move on to item nine E, which is the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division Links Terrace, Links Terrace Proportionate Fair Share Agreement. This is a resolution public hearing. A resolution approving the Links Terrace a Proportionate Fair Share Agreement between the City 
Meritage Homes of Florida, Inc. and the County of Volusia, providing for a developer to pay a proportionate fair share contribution in relation to the construction of the Lynx Terrace residential project, <coughs> generally located east of LPJ Boulevard and north of Champions Drive, authorizing the mayor and the city clerk to execute the agreement and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any questions? Yes, one. Mm -hmm. We discussed this, um, the fair share. Yes, ma'am. Can we make sure we are checking with county on this? Make sure. The fair share with the county, I would just like to make sure we are talking to them because just like the sidewalk fund I discussed with you, I would like to have some of that infrastructure for the roads for those specific so, development. If, if I may, Commissioner Cantu has spoken to me about proportionate fair share agreements that we're receiving now, which the city and the county had an agreement and it is related to Williamson and setting aside money to improve Williamson based on projects coming from Daytona. The majority of the money that you see in these agreements does go to the county, not to the city. And in the case of Williamson, there's the city contributions amounted to about $13 million projects from Daytona that went to the county to build the road, and in fact, they are building the road. Commissioner Cantu is suggesting that the city should take a similar posture with the county as it relates to things happening on the LPGA roadway. Is that correct? Oh, anywhere in the city. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, but you want to narrow it down. I think you need to. Let, let me tell you what the county's practice has been yeah, prior to. You can't make them. Prior to the agreement they entered with us as it related to Williamson. And when I say agreement, it was a tacit agreement. There wasn't a written document to do it. They simply agreed administratively with the city they would set aside money from projects that were loading Williamson to reserve the fair share money that came to the county to contribute towards the widening of Williamson between the point where the four lanes ended in Daytona to the point that four lanes started in Norman. The county has the authority under the charter to spend money collected in a particular county council district anywhere they want to in that district. And that's been their practice over the years. They've never done before what they did with us as it relates to Williamson. I'm so, so if you but want yeah, something, like uh, let me just finish if I could. So if, as it relates to LPGA, we could certainly approach them and suggest the same thing. I think if you do a scattergun approach, you take a chance in not getting anything done. If you focus it, there's a way to do that. And that's really our central issue. But the commission would need to direct the manager to undertake that activity with the county. I would like to see that because we need something done. And like we have the sun, some of the sidewalks coming in, but we need some of that money going to LPGA. I, I want to commend you for making that observation. And um, I think that's what a good commissioner does. Thank you. Uh, so I appreciate that. I, I, I agree with her. Right, I think we should uh, we should entertain that. We can't force them. We have to remember that. So I was involved in the Williamson directly, and I will get Mr. Fiatra when he comes back in to discuss the commission's direction, if in fact that is the commission's direction. Because, cause, you know, I sit here and I look at LPGA and You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've said this. I've had us to print out maps. I think we should have a workshop and make some decisions that say that, you know, it, it needs, it has to stop until the road is, is done. Well, the uh, road's not going to you know, be done for well, a while. Well, it, it doesn't matter. It has to stop, or we have to have some sort of plan. Something has to be in place other than uh, because it will, it, it's going to be stymied. Because the, the number of units that we're putting in is something to be contended with, you know. And, you know, the difference between a ride on LPGA at 7 a.m. and 7.45 is, is totally different. I, I, I know you They're not even the not same. It's like, you're, it's like you're in a different, a different town, especially 8.15. So I, I really think we need to, you know, have a have a work because it's not going to stop until we say that you know we want to address this and you know maybe get with the county to see you know 
And I know that LPJ is another animal, but that's a part of if, the solution. If that's the commission's direction, I, I agree with Mr. Fiatcher. Mm -hmm. I think we should have stopped a long time ago. Well, I don't the growth think is, there's is ridiculous. left over there. I oh, this, they're still oh, coming. No. Oh, no. They're still coming. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, there's nowhere well, near. towards um, um, International Speedway. Yeah. But if we. No, it's not. If we talk. But that's, oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah, different yeah. issue. We're but talking we, in terms of affecting LPGA. This fair share, yeah. I think, could help if we could make some kind of agreement with the county. It, it, it's a question of us asking, and they agree. Yeah. Correct. And there's rationale for it, and you've expressed it here. If the commission says to do that, I will speak to Mr. Fiatra when he comes back, and I'm sure he will undertake that. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, yeah. we definitely need to do that. Is that the direction? Yeah. Okay, that's the, that's the I direction. Mean, I don't want that's our good. money, uh, you know, I mean, well, it's the county's money going to DeLand or... It, it can't. But it can't. It's, but it can it go to... It's limited to the county but it can council go to Dunn. But it can go to Dunn. God, okay. But, <laughs> so, you know... But you, we still need it. Yeah, need it on the LPGA. Yeah, mm -hmm. Because I know, like, in the sidewalk fund, you told me it's pretty much like that. The developer... It's the same thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Same thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I do have Parker Menchenberg here to answer any questions if needed. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. We have a motion from Commissioner Traeger, a second, I believe, from Commissioner Cantu. We have a motion from Commissioner Traeger, and we have a second from Commissioner Cantu. And no other speakers. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. I would also like to uh, ask for a um, um, workshop on the LPGA corridor for housing and housing in terms of density and the saturation of the of the market in terms of the road. I, I think. We, we have to do that. Do you all concur? Because yeah. it has to come from us. It's not going to stop if we don't do it. Okay, or consider it, look at all the options, look at the maps, and, and see what we can do. Um, okay. Okay. Moving on to item 9F. It's Public Works Technical Services Preliminary and Final Plat and Contract for Plat Recording for the Lynx Terrence Phase 1. This is a resolution quasi-judicial hearing. A resolution approving the preliminary and final plat for the Lynx Terrace Phase 1 project, a single-family subdivision located northeast of the intersection of International Golf and Champions Drive, authorizing the city manager to sign the final plat and permit recordation, thereupon meeting certain conditions precedent, approving a contract for plat recording, providing construction of public improvements within the subdivision, approving a license agreement, providing for installation of certain private improvements with, within the subdivision right-of-way, and providing an effective date. So move. Well, we have a motion from Commissioner Cantu, second from... Commissioner May. May? Okay. Okay. Do we have any speakers? And I do have Parker Menchenberg here on behalf of the applicant for any questions. All right. No questions. All right. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. Okay. Moving on to 9G, it's a Public Works Technical Services Preliminary and Final Plat and Contract for Plat Recording for the Lynx Terrence Phase 2. This is a resolution quasi-judicial hearing. A resolution approving the preliminary and final plat for the Lynx Terrence Phase 2 project, a single-family subdivision located northeast of the intersection of International Golf and Champions Drive, authorizing the city manager to sign the final plat and permit recordation thereupon meeting certain conditions precedent, approving a contract for plat recording for the subdivision and providing an effective date. So moved. All right, motion uh, is uh, can two, second is May. Do we have any speakers? Just Mr. Menchenberg here. All right, no questions for Parker? All right, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. Okay. 
Okay. Moving on to 9H, it's the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Legends Preserve Proportionate Fair Share Agreement. This is a resolution public hearing. A resolution approving the Legends Preserve Proportionate Fair Share Agreement between the City Meritage Homes of Florida, Inc. and the County of Volusia, providing for the developer to pay a proportionate fair share contribution in relation to the construction of the Legends Preserve residential project, generally located south of Inter International Golf Drive and east of LPJ Boulevard, authorizing the mayor and the city clerk to execute the agreement and providing an effective date. Uh, we have a motion from Second. Commissioner May. Second from who? Reed. Reed. Commissioner Reed. Any questions or comments? And again, I have Parker Menchenberg here All right. for questions. <laughs> All right. No questions. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. Mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> Moving on to item 9I, it's the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Williamson Crossing, Lot 6, propor propor <laughs> Proportionate Fair Share Agreement, Resolution Public Hearing. A resolution approving the Williamson Crossing Lot 6 Proportionate Fair Share Agreement between the City, Shops at Williamson Crossing LLC, and the County of Volusia, providing for the developer to pay a proportionate fair share contribution in relation to a shopping center generally located at the southeast of the intersection, intersection of LPGA and Williamson Boulevard, authorizing the mayor and the city clerk to execute the agreement and providing an effective date. Second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner May and a second from Commissioner Reed. Do we have any questions? And any speakers? And I do have Jessica Gao here on behalf of the applicant. All right. I didn't know if she wanted to speak or not. No, no. Okay. all right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6 0. Okay. We'll now move on to item number 10, which is our administrative items. Item number 10A is the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division. 1113 West International Speedway Boulevard, Planning Development General Rezoning. This is an ordinance on first reading, an ordinance amending the zoning map of the Lands Development Code to rezone 1.3 plus or minus acres of property located at 1113 West International Speedway Boulevard, east of the Tarragona Shops and west of the Tarragona Tower from SFR 5, Single Family Residential 5, to PDG Plan Development General, approving the 1113 West ISB plan development agreement authorizing development of a commercial building on the property subject to certain conditions, authorizing the mayor and the city clerk to execute the agreement, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Do we uh, have any questions? I'm not so sure. Okay, we have any questions? No questions? Whose zone is this? I know it's first reading. He's Commissioner Reed, right? Okay, all right, we have a motion, we have a second. I know it's first reading and the second reading may be different. Uh, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Uh, motion uh, uh, carries uh, six zero. Five, five one. one, you said no? Okay, that's what I thought I heard. Sorry. Commissioner Reed oh. uh, opposed. Five two. Or four two. Four two. Okay. So four two Reed in May. No, uh, they might want to come back. Okay. And for the record, the public hearing is October twentieth. Okay. Moving on to 10B, it's the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, 1113 West ISB Small Scale Comprehensive Plan Amendment. This is an ordinance on first reading. An ordinance adopting a small scale comprehensive plan amendment in accordance with Chapter 163.3187 of Florida Statutes, amending the future land use map designation of 1.3 plus or minus acres of property located at 1113 West International Speedway Boulevard on the south side of the International Speedway Boulevard across from Daytona State College, immediately east of Tarragona Shops and immediately west of the Tarragona Arch, from office transition to low intensity commercial, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. A motion from Commissioner Henry and a second from Commissioner Cantu. Do you have any questions? All right. All right. Have a motion and a second. Mayor, uh, before we take the vote, could I say one thing, please? Yes. 
reading and these are applicant driven requests and so they are entitled to a public hearing on second reading and so um, to be consistent with the law you do need to pass these on first reading so they can have their public hearing at second reading yeah I, I, I know I Thank agree. You. yeah all right we have a motion we have a second do we have any uh, questions uh, from the Commission no comments all right all those in favor let it be noted by saying aye 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 uh, those opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> Four, two. Okay, and the public hearing is set for October 20th. <clears throat> Moving on to 10C, it is Legal Department, City Code Amendment, Chapter 62, Article 3, Nuisance Abatement. This is an ordinance on first reading. An ordinance amending Chapter 62, Article 3, City Code of Ordinances, <laughs> relating to the nuisance abatement to con form nuisance abatement provisions of the code to recent changes in state law by including additional grounds for declaration of a public nuisance, providing for conflicts, codification, and severability, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Henry and a second from Commissioner Cantu. Mm. Do we have any questions or comments? And none. Okay, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6 0. The public hearing is set for October 20th. <clears throat> okay, we're going to move on to item 10D. It's the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Clyde Moore's Vascular Business Professional BP rezoning. This is an ordinance on first reading, an ordinance amending the zoning map of the Land Development Code to rezone 2.9 plus or minus acres of property, generally located on the northwest quadrant of the Clyde Morris Boulevard and Florida Street intersection from RP Residential Professional to BP Business Professional, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Cantu and a second from Commissioner Henry. Do you have any questions? We have a speaker. I do have Joey Posey here on behalf of the applicant for any questions. Okay. All right. No questions. All right. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. Uh, the public hearing is set for October 20th. Moving on to item 10E, it's the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, DME Sports, LLC, Voluntary Annexation. This is an ordinance on first reading. An ordinance annexing into the city of Daytona Beach, one parcel of land containing 3.81 plus or minus acres, of acres generally located on the south side of Bellevue Avenue and the south of Daytona Beach Airport, <laughs> redefining the territorial boundaries of the city of Daytona Beach to include the property, redesignating the boundaries of zone four of the city of Daytona Beach to include the property, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith and providing an effective date. So move. Second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Henry and a second from Commissioner Cantu. Do we have any questions? Any speakers? Okay. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6-0. The public hearing is set for October 20th. <clears throat> Moving on to 10F, the Development and Administrative Services Planning Division, Mason Nova Commerce Park. This is an ordinance on first reading. An ordinance rezoning 16.3 plus or minus acres of property located at 1011 and 1021 Mason Avenue from BA Business Automotive and PDG Plan <coughs> Development General to PDG Plan Development General Zoning District, approving the first amended and restated Mason Nova Commerce Park Plan District Agreement, providing for the redevelopment of the property, including construction of additional buildings and signage, modification of permitted uses, and required upgrades to existing facades, landscaping, and parking, authorizing the mayor and the city clerk to execute the agreement, approving the preliminary plat, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Reed and a second from Commissioner Henry. Do we have any questions or comments? All right, the speakers. All right, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Mm -hmm. Motion carries 6-0. The public hearing is set for October 20th. Moving on to item 10G, 
It's Development Administrative Services Planning Division, Land Development Code Text Amendment, Outdoor Art Display and Sales Activities on Main Street and Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune Boulevard. This is an ordinance on first reading. An ordinance amending Section 5.3 of the City Land Development Code relating to accessory uses and structures to authorize outdoor art displays and sales as an accessory use for certain commercial properties located in the RDB2, RDB3, RDD3, RDM2, RDM5, and BR1 zoning districts, subject to use specific standards, providing a sunset date, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict to with, and providing an effective date. So, second. second. I do have one question as well. I, just for the record. And, and I'm sorry, who was the motion in the second? Oh. Uh, we'll go with Henry and read okay, Henry's thank motion. You. Sorry, okay. okay. I just have one question, um, just for the record. Before it sunsets within a year, it will come back before to us. The, um, yes, the ordinance adopting the, re the uh, regulation requires it to come back to you before it sunsets. I also want to point out that we moved the sunset date back because we delayed the approval of this. So the new sunset date is October 19, 2022, mm -hmm. which is your second meeting in October. Okay. Uh, I have a few questions, please. Mm -hmm. And these are brought up to me by various business owners in different areas. So the first question would be, if you own, and we went over today, but I want to be clear because I've got people listening. So if I own a butcher shop, let's say it's a good example, and I want to sell shoes outside as a vendor, can't do it. It has to be art-related sales dealing with art, correct? That is correct, Commissioner. The second paragraph of the memorandum from Mr. Morozik dated September 27, 2021, specifically says the exception is the outside activities would be limited to art display and sale of items related to art displays. The outside activities are personal to the permittee and must be contained on the business property owner's private property. Okay. Now, who determines what art is? So, for example, if I have a T-shirt shop... Um, no correction, I'm a butcher because it's so removed. I'm a butcher and I want to do t-shirts on the on the side and I think they're artistic. Can I sell that? And these questions have actually come up with me this week, so I just want to be sure we're being clear. What can I sell out there? What if, what if I'm adding a little extra logo on the bottom or doing some sort of hand painting at the bottom of the t-shirt? It's still art, it's artistic, it's, is that considered art? <laughs> I think the Supreme Court had to try and deal with that question on pornography, and it was hard to figure out. I'm not sure what the answer to your question is. So the actual language in, in the code will be fine art or local crafts, which would be allowed. And also, if I have a butcher shop and I want to bring vendors, I use the word vendors loosely. My definition of vendors is somebody wants to, it's, I don't have the product, someone else is coming in from another part of town, and they say to me, hey, can I use your store, the front of your store, outside your store, to make the sale? How many people can I have do that? So, first of all, first of all it's not limited to people, it's limited to place. Okay. It, it says that it must be contained on the business property owner's private property. So, it depends upon the property and what they decide to do. It's also going to be dependent upon the zoning of the property. Presuming the principal uses butcher shop and there are sales there pursuant to these zones, I would say you could do it, but it's going to be dependent upon the amount of space that you have and that sort of thing. Because it isn't something like a festival or a bike week vending operation. Okay. And then finally, with regard to permitting, I want this on the record. This is not something where the primary owner of the facility has consignment vendors. Maybe they're charging them and maybe they're not charging them. So. They don't I'm pay gonna, anything I'm going to I'm gonna try to restate your question, but I think it's the same question. The, the way that this moves forward is the business in the zones that are included, which is RDB2, RDB3, RDB, RDM2, and RDM5, have the ability, if they wish, to include as a part of their business receipt operation sale of art display and sale of items related to art displays on their private property. It's a part of their permit to do business. Okay. So it isn't a special permit like you would have, again, mm -hmm. similar to a bike week operation or okay. perhaps a festival. Okay. All right, thank you. Hopefully that helps those who ask the question and who are watching tonight. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, do we have any other questions or comments on this item? All right, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries.
six zero. The public hearing is set for October 20th. Uh, commission comments. Commence with, is it Commissioner Reed? Commissioner Henry. 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 Oh, okay. Henry. Right. Let's see. Uh, no comments tonight. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody's had a long day over there. <laughs> Commissioner Reed? Uh, yes, sir, just a few. Um, the end of our concerts for the summer series ended with jazz in the park. It was really nice. Uh, as I mentioned in my, in my prayer, and I'm sure you'll say something in regards to the statue coming to town, um, I'd like to welcome the Wildcats back to Daytona Beach for homecoming this weekend, and let's all pray for at least one victory. There are none thus far. <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow's my birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. Right. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. All right. So Commissioner Trigger. Well, there have been four new opening or ribbon cutting ceremonies that I know of. The first one was Little Italy on Beach Street. Uh, very friendly people, very good food. I think it will be an asset to Beach Street. Uh, Wawa opened another station on um, East, uh, West ISB. This is the third one in Daytona Beach. Um, they're very community-oriented. Uh, they had contest of a hoagie building between the fire department and the um, police department. In this case, the fire department took home a trophy, but both uh, sides took home a $1,000 Check for their contribution from the, for contribution to their favorite charity, and uh, Wawa also gives to a number of other charities. Easter Seals moved from Dunn Avenue over to building on Ridgewood Avenue uh, for more space. They have number of, of programs for the children, and uh, the walls were painted with some murals, very pretty. And last but not least, Surf's Up Computing had their uh, ribbon cutting on Bevel Road. So it looks like we're starting to get really, really, really very busy. Mm -hmm. Very good. Commissioner May? On um, this past weekend, Reverend McGallard, Alan Chaplin, and myself sponsored an event called Love in Action in Midtown. We gave away gift cards. We had music. We had entertainment. We had different vendors there as well. It was a free event to the community. And it was a really well attended. Uh, the Florida Blue was present, handing out information as well. But it was a fantastic event. And um, Ms. Linda McGee won a $200 gift card. And another homeless gentleman won a $200 gift card also. And then one of the, um, one of the team members at Allen Chapel also won. But it was a really nice event with great weather. And it was all free, just because sometimes it's good to see love in action. And that's really what it was about, just to do it. And then finally, um, I support housing tremendously, but my idea of housing has always been home ownership. So to that end, I think that is the way to go. It builds equity and builds a foundation for future generations, and people stay, and that's important to me. So Fifth Third, as along with Allen Chapel again, they are having a housing fair on November 4th, and I think that you will see some nice surprises there as it relates to housing some things that we've been talking about, and so I'm looking forward to all of us joining them there. And that will be on November 4th. So thank you so much for supporting that uh, with some of my Bike Week funds. Thank you. Commissioner mm -hmm. Kendrick. Parking space, mm -hmm. and we are flying the Purple Heart flag. I am not calling municipalities, they are calling me. So we were in Deltona um, on Tuesday, was it Monday? Monday or Tuesday, I'm getting my days mixed up. I think it was Monday. Um, they donated, um, they are doing three Purple Heart parking spaces. We will be in Pearson um, next week. And then South Daytona actually called and they bought their own flags and want to fly them <laughs> and want Purple Heart parking spaces, so. You set the wave when well, you did that I first one. one. I wouldn't <laughs> say me, yeah, but yeah. So, I'm excited. Yeah, great. Awesome, awesome. Okay, I don't have much tonight. Uh, I gave you all a, a list of things. We have a, uh, I guess the staff will share with you the a list of items to be considered for next week. I never did massage that, 
but uh, yes, sir. Uh, commission members, you have a copy of a memorandum from Mayor Henry. It was on your dais tonight. We just got it late this afternoon. Um, Rose Askew and I will be working from this information and other comments that city commissioners have made to develop some ideas for the workshop on the 13th next week. And uh, so this is just rough information here. I've got to go through it further than I have so far. But Commissioner May had asked for a copy and it's distributed to the commission at large when one commissioner gets something. So this is part of the information Mayor Henry talked about at the last meeting. And we'll be asking for input and so on and working to get the stuff prepared for next week to give you some ideas. It isn't meant to be a final idea or anything like that. We want to have your input, incorporate everything that comes in. So next week will be a working document that will build from this. I don't expect it to be finished next week. If it is, that'd be fantastic, but I would be very surprised about that. As a side note, tonight initially was going to have revised standards for Bike Week and Biketoberfest. But with the mayor's comments at the last meeting, his comments were extensive and I thought went farther than what we had done as a staff to propose changes. And I think actually the mayor's uh, writing refers to that a little bit in terms of the change was minimal. And I thought there was a reference to we need a bulldozer somewhere in here. So we're going to be working on the bulldozer. Bulldozer. We bring that to you. Yeah. Are you joking? Well, I, don't, don't, don't take that to be a literal. Earth movie. Um, it, it, we just we need to have a discussion that is wide open uh, of possibilities, and that's really what that is. It's wide open to, but it's mainly to do what we believe at this time is necessary to transform Main Street, and to a lesser degree, but to a, in other ways a, an equal degree, MMB. But I believe MMB has other issues that, that in, in, in other ways that we may be able to help. Uh, but either way, both areas need uh, a transformation, and that's really what the document is about. It, it, it comes across to say that nothing is off limits. And, and we can't have, we have to have that. I, I'm, I'm that type of thinker. Um, okay. Anything else on that? No, sir. No. I don't have any other okay. comments. All right. Uh, the Mayor's Fitness Challenge is going well. Um, pardon? <laughs> Commissioner Reed says she's going to win. I can't deny that she could, but uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm moving well. I'm not attending as many sessions as I would like, but I am working out at home, and I'm eating better. And so uh, I, I do want to say this, though. I was looking at some data last night on our schools in Daytona Beach. And the attendance of a number of our schools um, is really the worst in all of Volusia County, from the high school to Campbell to um, even Champion Elementary. When you look at the, the attendance data, and when you look at the attendance data in your city compared to other schools, it's a very telling statistic about the overall um, social and emotional health of your community. And so I want us to be cognizant of that fact as a telling statistic of how much work we still have to do in terms of creating um, viable employment opportunities, uh, continuing to uh, expand our tax base, um, and, and continuing to attract um, the types of businesses that will help our residents to be able to sustain themselves uh, for generations to come. I agree with the assessment that um, home ownership should be a priority. And I think we all agree, you know, uh, and that's in part why we've had some of the partnerships that we have, and we've encouraged other partnerships uh, with Homes Bring Hope and, and anyone else who wants to help people to own their own homes. But I, I also believe that we have to have a plethora of options for our residents because, you know, many of our residents, by virtue of just looking at that statistic alone, they're just not ready for home ownership. They don't have their ducks in a row to be able to achieve the American dream in that way. Uh, so we have to, and, and if you look at 
the number of homeless families in our city, uh, it too uh, speaks to the level of work that we have to continue to do. So again, I want to commend each of you for the work that you are doing. Uh, I want to commend both of our uh, hopefuls, candidates for uh, our missing seat. Uh, and we, we look forward to you all having uh, a good finish to your election season and helping us to complete ourselves. So with that said, uh, good night and, and, uh, from this commission. And we'll now hear from our residents. Is it the workshop at five? Five o'clock. Mm -hmm. And it's in room 149B. Mm -hmm. Okay, our first public speaker in our public comment forum tonight is Monica Paris, and on deck is John Nicholson. Okay, no worries. Hello, my name is Monica Paris. I live at 120 Seaspray Street. Um, I became a resident of Daytona Beach in 2016. I love it here. And uh, in the last year, I've noticed that there is a lot of uh, people that are on drugs that are on the street. And this is during the day, talking to themselves. I live on beach side, so I, I've noticed it. And then I've also learned that we've had 75% of overdose deaths in the last year. Um, I really don't know what is being done to fix that problem, not fix it or help the people that do have that problem. Uh, another thing is uh, Saturday evening, no, I'm sorry, Sunday evening, eight o'clock, I went to the boardwalk because I wanted to go see what it was all about. I feel like it's a step away from being Venice Beach. They had a lot of homeless people there. They were smoking pot out in the <laughs> open. We had families that were walking there with their children, people passed out on the benches. I don't think that's really an image that we want to portray. I don't feel that people maybe feel safe when they come here. Then I decided to take a walk on Sea Breeze, which was very interesting. Um, well, anyway, I just see a lot of this and I want to know what we could do as a community to help. And also in the two hours that I was walking around, I didn't see one police car. There were people drag racing on A1A and Seabreeze. So I just wanted to see if there's something that we could do. If you guys need more funding, do we have to, I don't know, get a fund going? But whatever we need to do as a community, I want to help. And uh, thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. you, you, thanks for your comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Nicholson. And on deck is, I think it's Antoinette. Nolan. Noli. Nolan. I'll get it right. <laughs> John Nicholson, 413 North Granbury Avenue. Stacy, to answer you, the county divides it up, the county into four sections, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. We share our funds with seven other cities. So we don't get the funds that we really need. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, several years ago, I talked to uh, the county. We are a donor city. And we've always been a donor city. If you look at Volusia Forever, we've put in probably $60 million, and we've got back 750000 That's not a good ratio. We lose money at ECHO. We lose money with the school board. We lose money every time we deal with the city and the county. So uh, when you're looking at the funding that's coming down the pike, um, years ago, um, I go to the planning board, and I spoke with Mori Hosseini years ago, and he said, when the time is right, I'm going to invest, because he hadn't built a single house in the city of Daytona Beach, and we gave him money for his corporate headquarters. He said, I'm not going to build until it's ready. Well, there was a rumor that there was somebody buying property out west of 95. One was him, and the other was Margaritaville. And somebody on this board said, nope, they're not buying out there. There's no need to worry about what's going out there. I asked them to widen LPGA, and I gave the example of Kendall Drive in Miami, the road to nowhere. It's now seven lanes and bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. So our TPO rep said, nope, it's on the agenda for 2049. They will widen LPGA, and there's no need because nobody is going to build west of LPGA before 2025 or later. There's already two, almost 2,000 homes 
in Margaritaville that's not supposed to be there. In two years, there's an $8 million debt each and every year coming to the county. If some of you remember several years ago, we had a 27% tax increase because we did rollback, 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 rollback. And we had to do something about it. Well, that $8 million is coming due. I'm asking you all to pay attention because the county tax is going to increase and you're going to need to increase. So look at the money, every penny. Don't sit there and say, oh, well, it's only $5 million we're giving to ECHO and we're not going to get anything back from it. It's only $10 million there. Those are real money. So I'm asking you, Stacey, I know you're good at that. Juanita, you're good at that. Look at the pennies. Look at the money. Because there's going to be a time we're going to need that money. And I'm saying it's coming down the pike. You didn't believe me when I said LPGA needed to be widened. You didn't believe me when I said that Tangier Outlet Mall. Yes. These things are coming. Be aware. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Ant Antoinette Noelian. Okay. And on deck is Frederick Brown. Good evening, Mayor, City Commissioners, Council, Deputy City Manager. My name is Antoinette Noelian. I simply wanted to come before you today to say that I was very interested in applying for the Economic and Redevelopment Director's position that the city has available. And I have experience. I've been a, a resident. Well, I'm a resident of Flagler County, but I'm in Daytona every day. I am very involved. I'm on the um, school advisory committees for both Campbell Middle School as well as Mainland High School. I'm a planner for the Juneteenth Annual Festival and as well as um, Commissioner May's recent event. I was the event manager for that as well. I say this to say I am very involved in the community and I know how to be creative to bring economic ideas here and to get things involved and to improve uh, different structures that I am involved in and I've seen around. But I just want to, again, let you guys know that I'm very interested and I will apply. Thank you. Our next speaker is Frederick Brown and on deck is Sharice Boyd. Uh, before I start my remarks, I did want to have a point of order question. Uh, I noticed on the consent agenda, we read through the items. I don't recall ever hearing a, a motion to accept. Did I miss something there? There was. Yeah, I think you did. Okay, I'll go back and read it, but I just didn't hear it. So, all right, I just wanted to ask that. All right, it's Frederick Brown. Uh, you've already started the clock. Um, uh, 1508 Crescent Ridge. Uh, again, I want to thank the mayor for his involvement in the uh, park situation on Beachside and the river access. Uh, I'm hoping we're, we're following through on that. I haven't heard much activity on it of late, but uh, thank you for your support on that. I think you realize how important that is to the citizens. I also think it's important that we, uh, in uh, Zone 3, uh, we work on developing the area on uh, Lenox as well, which has also been a site that's been used by residents for many, many years. The other subject I've talked about a few times in the past has been about safety on sidewalks, uh, crosswalks here in Daytona Beach. And I realize you have state regulations. Well, there's also federal regulations, but there's state, county, and city. The problem I see here is manifold, okay? There's, um, when you're dealing with the state, they have their own ideas on how to do things. And unfortunately, sometimes it appears that we're being used as guinea pigs on this. Uh, case in point, there are some safety uh, innovations that have come out recently, especially with the technology. Uh, there's a technology known as Hawk, which is the high intensity activated crosswalk. An example of that is the crosswalk between Daytona State College and uh, Mainland High School. Uh, it's a very high visibility and it has a success rate of uh, 80, uh, I'm sorry, 78 to 82 percent dri driver compliance, which is relatively high. We have other problem areas and unfortunately just had another death on Route 1. And of course, A1A is notorious for killing people. And I'm still uh, reminded, because I drive by it on a daily basis, of the two women that were hit uh, just down the street from my house. There are fixes to these problems, as I've stated before. 
I don't know the best avenue to work with this, but I would like to see the city of Daytona Beach adopt a standardization on crosswalks, work with the DOT so that they see things our way, which is to maintain pedestrian safety. There are several issues involving the way the signs ordinances are that need to be related to it, and I believe that contributed to the death on A1A earlier this spring. I would love to see a workshop on that, and I would love to work with you, uh, the commission and, and the mayor on that. Uh, I am going to put my last uh, remark, a shameless plug for the veterans. Uh, tomorrow, October 7th, uh, our vet Vietnam Veterans 1048 is a fundraiser at um, Sonny's Barbecue, and I don't have enough flyers to pass out. But if you go and say that you're doing it in the name of the veterans, they donate to the organization 25% of the proceeds. So thank you. Thank you. Walkway between Daytona State and Mainland. Okay, it's, the system is called Hawk. Okay, I'll be glad to talk to you in detail well, about it. Well, I know Davis, Representative Davis Santiago is the one who got that through. When, right. right, and that's a DOT and you're thing. Saying, right, and you're saying there's still a problem? Well, there's enhancements that could be made to that, and mainly that's the, what they call in, ro okay, in where roadway. Where are you the statistics from? Uh, from the safety boards. Okay. The national statistics. That's that's right. it, it's Thank legit you. stuff. But the in roadway lights are the ideal. They do use them over on the west coast of Florida very successfully, and that's part of the standard that I would like to see as a drop because uh, I don't okay, go over. Okay, sir. Thank you. It, Thank you. Your eyes are taken away from the pedestrian. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharice Boyd, and on deck is Marjorie Johnson. All right, the last time y'all got to hear me today. Um, public protection, one, I noticed in the last time I spoke with uh, Chief Young, you have an excessive amount of vacancy, so I'm not sure what you all are doing about that. When I looked on the website, I saw public protection, um, a lot of vacancies there. However, as I went through and I looked at the openings, I see that there's still a lot of jobs um, that start at 11. So I'm not sure what the plan is to get to the $15 an hour. Um, I may have missed that, but I did not hear about that. Next is, I'm very happy to know that Main Street Station will be doing as they've done for all Biketobers except for the last one, or I guess last two now. And um, small business grants, I saw it, I was trying to figure out, you know, people are asking me, coming to me for information, and I just need to know if more funds are available. And I know you can't answer, but if someone would let us know that. And the next thing is, I think you all should consider partnering up with some of these local nonprofits. The government does partner up with United Way, Blood, um, One Blood. The city does it as well. You have fundraisers, I guess, and do certain things. I think you should also look into that, especially where it won't cost you all money. But um, you'll find that there's a lot of nonprofits here that want to do things that you all are trying to do. If you partner with them and there's no cost to you all, it helps them as a nonprofit show um, it helps them get other sponsorships, which will bring stuff here. And I think a lot of the things that we hear people talk about up here are things that we have people everywhere I go in our city that are trying to do these things or are doing them successfully. Um, you partnering with them or the city partnering with them would get it more notoriety. It would be more resourceful, access to more people, and it would make y'all look right. It would make you look good, real good. Um, next up, thank you. Councilwoman Henry and Cantu for correcting me. I didn't know about the tennis. I actually love tennis, and I'm always like, I never see anyone play tennis here. So thank you, ladies. Um, also, um, he's not here, but I think it was um, the deputy manager uh, who made this possible so that we will, or the city manager made it possible so that we get those text messages and notifications. Thank you very much. That is an improvement, and I hope y'all do it when we have another water boil mandate or something like that. And the last thing, or two things are, uh, when we were talking about the homeless people or people on Section 8, there are people with graduate degrees and more educated than me that are homeless right now by no fault of their own, just COVID, people who've lost their husbands and wives who are the main providers, so that, unfortunately, there is a negative stigmatism on people who are on Section 8. I grew up in the projects. I'm from all that, food stamps and everything. And there is, and there's even an embarrassment on that end before I realized, well, everybody in the projects is poor, so I shouldn't be embarrassed just one out. But we need to give them that without bad mouthing them and shaming them. But as a person from the property management, I have seen it. And last, um, I walked through zone two yesterday. We really need to get that area cleaned up. So please win, Ken. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Marjorie Johnson. On deck is Patricia Hurd. Marjorie Johnson. 
Thompson, 122 South Keach Street. I'd just like to say that it was a disgrace that only 66 people voted at Allen Chapel Church with this special election. So I hope that you would do more advertisement when this special election runoff on November the 2nd. I was at Allen Chapel campaigning for Ken Strick and the candidate that we supported that taped these meetings and you all took us out of the meeting. He did an outstanding job with that. We need people who are going to be accessible. And right now, we don't have that. Paul Reed prayed tonight, stating that there's and thanking something for harmony. Well, there is no harmony here in this city. And the mayor is giving away, our, and this city commissioners are giving away our public land behind our blacks. This is a disgrace. There's no harmony when we don't have taxpaying residents, don't have access to our mayor or our city commission, Paula Reed. There are a lot of people complaining that they try to meet with you. You haven't met with them. You haven't got back to them. You're not addressing their issues. The city manager did meet with me and address some of my issues. I brought a group of people in there that had some serious concerns, and he did have a meeting with me. He's the only one that's met with anyone to address these issues that we have in our community. And I see you have a list of streets you're going to pave here, and the streets that need to be paved in my area is Keith Street from my street all the way down, cracked up in front of my house, she broke down in front of the mosque, there with the Muslim meat, the Linda McGee is all cracked up. You go further down all the way to the projects that entire street. I have a list of them here, and none of those streets are on this list. But to Cookman College, it's pumped millions of dollars in this economy. We have graduates up here. I've been here addressing the fact that you took us out of our meetings. There was no harmony. You took away our, our public speaking here at this podium. We had never had that under any other mayor. That's not harmony. That's discrimination. And when people come in here, your clerks are harassing them, saying that you can't sit. I did get in touch with some high officials. And they said that you all was violating our rights. You can't tell people where to sit in a public building. People were lying, putting the police on people, talking about somebody sat in a little boy's lap. And the Tony Durbin's called the police chief and said that never happened, that they was harassing me. And you bought Lynn Thompson in here. They didn't do that at the county. The county also recognized them, and the people came and sat where they wanted to sit. So that is not harmony. And so I'm going to say to you tonight, that you need to be cognizant of the fact that you're here to do the people's work, and you need to meet with these constituents and address their issues like our new city manager did. The only reason we're back on the clock is because I got here and advocated for that. And for more time, you got here, we had 30 minutes, three minutes before, three hours. and now we're down to 30 is Ms. Patricia Hurd. Let's go. Good afternoon, Patricia Hurd, 822 Vernon Street, uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. Number one, speeding, more speed signs and bumpers needs to be placed in, in zone six. Um, pass it on MLK. I know you all have noticed the width of MLK between International and MMBB. Those, those girls, those students are going around you on the right and on the left. Double lines are out there, but they're still going around. And remember, I say on the right. We need to do something about that. All of the signs on poles uh, make the city and the area look very tacky. Those promoters who come to town and give different events and things, they put their posters up everywhere. On the corner International, MLK, in the community, everywhere. Something needs to be done about that. Uh, the bench, I think this is at the Campbell School Pool, Campbell Pool. The bench is being used for homeless hangouters, and they sit and lay on during the day. Also, 
They are not using the trash cans. They are throwing all of the trash on the ground. MLK and cedar is used all day long for the guys and some females to hang out all day. I want you all to drive by there. You wouldn't have it nowhere else. They were across the street at the store for years. Until about a month ago, the owners painted the building and had them to leave, I guess, which was good. No trespassing signs are placed over there where they are now, but that doesn't mean a thing. Trash all over the place. My question is, what can be done to clean the area up? Please get back with me, somebody, because it's terrible. Okay. That's respected. Okay. That was that, my final uh, that's our final speaker. And uh, three quick things before I hit the gavel. One, I forgot to mention that it's National Walk to a Park Day on October 10th. I sent this to staff at 1 or 2 o'clock this morning, and they have it in the brochure today, so uh, for the underneath the manager's comments. So if you walk to a park on Sunday, the goal is for a healthy city to have a park within 10 minutes of where you live. We're going to continue to work towards that throughout the city as a goal. It's aspirational. I think we're somewhere at maybe 59 percent or something, but that could, should continue. And so if you walk to a park, please post it online on Sunday and promote our parks because we have made great strides in that area. Very proud of the Derbyshire area sidewalks, $750,000. And you see the road resurfacing efforts kick into high gear. That's because this commission and the last commission agreed to double what we were spending on roads. Before we were spending $2 million, we're now up to $4 million. And I think it will show, a it, we will begin to see a tremendous difference um, in our roads. So thanks, and don't let anyone tell you that you're not doing a great job. What's hmm? name, the task force that you did? Oh, uh, the task force on, was it Tuesday night, that uh, was inspired by Commissioner Cantu and uh, the manager and myself, and every municipality on the East Coast was represented. The discussion uh, was was very uh, unified, came away with the idea of all uh, supporting uh, going to Tallahassee and asking to give us municipalities more authority to address these invasion type activities in our community. Uh, also, there was a lot of discussion on um, essentially being uniform and being tough as it relates to demanding that our standards are supported by our visitors. Uh, and by that we mean if it requires impounding, uh, more citations, uh, bringing in uh, more law enforcement from other communities when we know inv these events are gonna take place. Those were among the ideas discussed. Um, but we do have to remember that the invasion events are different than the truck events because the truck events are planned. Uh, we think we'll be able to sort of squeeze those out more than the invade events because they might they're like pop up events. But at any rate, it was a great discussion, and uh, again, thanks to every, all the participating cities who engaged us. Um, and for what it's worth, don't let anybody tell you that you don't live in a great community. You do because you make it great. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>